Crowds gather to catch a glimpse of these steel giants passing through towns and ports. Romanticizing the life of a Great Lakes freighter. It easily can be forgotten that these ships were built with one purpose. To work 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 10 months out of the year. Great Lakes freighters have a much longer lifespan than ocean-going vessels. This is due to saltwater being very harsh and corrosive. Their lifespan ranging between 25 to 30 years. Whereas a Great Lakes freighter cannot live the humans that built them. When does their time come, and what happens to these ships? As World War II broke out, the United States joined war production. Their secret weapon? having an abundance of iron ore in their many ranges. Loaded with iron ore, these trains haul to Duluth, Minnesota, where ships await for them on Lake Superior. These ships then loaded with thousands of tons of iron ore. Make their way to the war factories. One load of iron ore on a Great Lakes freighter was enough to build eight destroyer ships. Demonstrating how much the United States relied on iron ore trade and Great Lakes shipping. So much so that they made an addition to the Sioux Locks. The MacArthur Lock opened in 1943. Into the MacArthur Lock. Measuring at 800 feet, for the very first time, ships over 700 feet had clearance through the Sioux Locks. This would change Great Lakes shipping forever. With one setting a completely new standard in shipbuilding. Michigan in 1958 by Great Lakes Engineering for the Northwestern Mutual Life Insurance Company, the SS Edmund Fitzgerald was truly a vessel for its time. At 729 feet in length, 75 feet in breadth, and a gross tonnage of 13,632 pounds, the Fitzgerald boasted a tremendous cargo capacity. Nicknamed the Big Fitz, it was the largest ship ever to sail in Great Lakes waters at the time of its launching. The Edmund Fitzgerald set a new standard in shipbuilding. Northwestern Mutual invested money in its appearance and accommodations. The Edmund Fitzgerald only crewed the best and the most experienced in the industry. It was beloved by many, and crowds would gather to go get a glimpse of the Edmund Fitzgerald going by. 
It wasn't long before other companies wanted to follow suit. And the Edmund Fitzgerald's biggest competitor was born. In 1958, Inland Steel introduced the Edward L. Ryerson. Named after the company's former chairman. With the intention to be as aesthetically pleasing as possible, fast, and haul a lot of iron ore. It wasn't long before the Ryerson gained recognition. And most wouldn't know that the Ryerson was the Edmund Fitzgerald's biggest competitor. The two would go back and forth setting records for the largest amount of iron ore hauled. Eventually, the Edmund Fitzgerald set a record at the time that no one else could beat, 27,000 tons of iron ore in one load. The Ryerson was nicknamed Fast Eddie because it hit 19 knots, the fastest ship on the Great Lakes. It had the Fitzgerald beat because it only hit 16 knots. Although the Ryerson was often overshadowed by the Edmund Fitzgerald. The Ryerson continued a successful career on the Great Lakes. Until about 1986 when she was put in layup for the very first time. Good evening. Today is Black Monday, the day the Dow dropped more than 500 points. The day the Dow dropped more than 22%, almost double the rate of the Black Monday that signaled the beginning of the crash of 1929. The economy very much so affecting Great Lakes shipping. Just like many other ships, the Ryerson would continue to go in and out of layup. This not always being a negative thing. A ship can be put in layup for repairs or upgrades to extend their life on the Great Lakes. To maximize cargo space, the Ryerson was built without self-unloading equipment. To unload, the Ryerson would need the assistance of Hollets. Where the hungry monsters scoop up 20 tons of ore at a bite. And they could only deliver to ports that had this technology. Most modern Great Lakes ships were built with self-unloading equipment. And by the early 2000s, shoreside hullets were almost obsolete. So where does that lead the fate for the Edward L. Ryerson today? A far cry from breaking records.
The Ryerson has been in layup since 2009. with not much information about her future. But the Ryerson is not alone. John Sherwin, built in 1958. Laid up in 2006. The Sherwin also does not have self-unloading equipment. There has been some speculation if the Ryerson will be returning to service. In February of 2023, the Ryerson's AIS system was turned on. The system hasn't been in use since 2009. Construction workers on the ship were rumored to be seen in 2023. The ship's owner, Central Marine Logistics, has not made any statement regarding the ship's future.